we've been talking about doing this for so long and it just sort of never happened and suddenly at the spur of the moment, here we are. And I'm, I'm amazed and, and humbled at this great audience we had on such a short notice. So uh, I, I guess Manu is an important place. Um, it has a certain mystery to it. And so that's why we decided to, I decided to talk about some of the mysteries that I've worked at in Manu over the years. Um, I first came to Manu in 1986. I was 20 years old, an undergraduate at Princeton. And there, there was a recent issue of Yajeros celebrating the 50 years of Manu National Park, which you'll see lying around tourist lodges and stuff in the Amazon and around. And they did, they did a special issue about Manu's 50 years. And I found a picture of this first expedition that I went on in 1986 with John Turbor of Princeton University. And Ernesto Reyes, um, Cesar Flores, Walter Roos, Lily Rodriguez, all of these people are now huge names in biodiversity conservation. Walter Roos is a very famous photographer. And we were all you know, undergrads, first time in the, in the rainforest. So you know, my first field project was frustrating because I wasn't allowed to go into the, into the reserve zone in Monarch National Park. I worked in Diamante. Outside, yeah, outside. So I wanted to go up here to the Taikom Yemiwatu, but I ended up doing my first field work along here on the Madre Dios. The year later, when I came back, I spent a year working in Taikom Yemiwatu inside the reserve zone. I had the experience necessary and I got the permits to work in the park. And so, my project I was looking at um, Machiginga health status and medicinal plants. With the, the, my, my idea was to find a way of improving indigenous people's health by combining you know, Western health care with, with traditional medicine with ethnobotany. And so I spent um, that first year in the field, most of the time in Yomibato and Taikome, collecting plants, doing interviews about um, you know, illnesses in the past, um, interviewing women about how many children they had, how many had died, and so on. So a, a general overview of health and ethnobotany. But it just so happens that I'm from Virginia. I grew up in rural Virginia. My father was an avid hunter, hunting ducks, fishing, crabbing, deer hunting. And so um, an important part of being a Machinina young man is hunting. And in Manu Park, because of the park's restrictions, they still mostly hunt with bow and arrow. It's one of the few places in the Amazon, aside from isolated indigenous settlements, where the main weapon is still bow and arrow. And so I was eager to learn how to hunt the bow and arrow. Um, you know, I practiced, I, got, I learned how to make arrows. I didn't quite learn how to make bows, but I tried. And, and I was just working really hard to, to learn how to hunt. And finally, one day, Marino, this is my Machiginga brother-in-law, um, he said, get your arrow. There's a, there's, a, there's a monkey that swam across the river, and it's, low, it's, sort of, it's, you know, it's a pretty easy shot. It's low along the riverbank. Get your arrow. And so I grabbed and got my arrow, and I, two shots, and I killed my first monkey. And I was so, just so overjoyed, so happy. So I had them take a picture, I carried the thing, I, you know, I carried it myself, and Marino was sort of standing back looking at me weird, but he didn't say anything. And so I took it to, my, to a friend's wife, and I said, oh, I killed my first monkey, let's cook it and eat it. She cooked it, we ate it. Marino didn't say anything, and then a couple days later, we were out hunting again, and there was a, there was a, there was like a, there was a stream bank, and, and there was like a, an embankment here, and there was a, there was a paca, a, a, an agouti, this large rodent there, the best meat in the Amazon, so good. And it was sort of trapped in that little, it couldn't get out because it was a high embankment. And we just said, kill him, kill him. It was an easy shot. I mean, the monkey was way up like this. It, the, 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 this paca was like right over there. I take the arrow. And the arrow goes off like this. He says, shoot, shoot again. And the arrow goes over here. I sh take three shots, and my arms are just shaking. I can't shoot. And he just grabs it, and the mother kills it right away. And I said, what's going on? I was such a good shot with the, with the, with the monkey. He goes, you ate it. You killed it. You carried it. You bragged about it, and you ate it. When, 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 when a young man kills his first animal, he doesn't touch it. He doesn't get near it. He can't touch its blood. He has someone else carry it. He never brags about it. He says, oh, I didn't kill it. It, it, it. You know, he makes up some excuse. Well, my dad really killed it. And you don't eat it. Because when you, when you, you know, for the first couple of animals you kill, you don't get anywhere near it. You can't touch it. 
He says, you, you basically broke all the rules in my chicken and hunting. I said, I said, well, why didn't you tell me? He goes, you don't know? <laughs> so this is I started collecting plants. You know, I was collecting medicinal plants. What are the plants used for medicine? And it turned out that about 25% of the plants that I was collecting weren't, I mean, they had, they had plants for diarrhea and leishmaniasis and headache, all these things, but 25% of the plants didn't have anything to do with what we would call medicine. They were plants <clears throat> that make men better hunters. And, and Marino and the other said, since you broke all the rules, we break the rules sometimes too. You know, you, you, um, you kill an animal that gets away, and the game animal, the owner of the game animal, the spirit owner, won't let you kill any more animals because you smell like a vulture. Or you, you, you know, if, you're, if your wife is on her period and you go hunting, that odor of the menstrual blood will, will, will mess up. And the, 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 game, the, the, the owner, the spirit owner of the game animal will smell you coming and won't let you see any animals. Or if, you, if your wife is cooking a pot of meat and the pot boils over and that froth that has the meat broth in it falls into the fire, that, 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 that foam burns and the smell goes into the forest and the owner of the, the, owner of the animals, the spirit owner says, who's wasting my bounty? And so the next time he goes into the forest, they say his, his, his flesh smells like vultures. And he doesn't even see animals to hunt because the, the game animal owner hides in the spirit hide. And so the idea behind these hunting medicines is to, there's some medicines that are applied directly into the eyes. They say they clean out your eyesight and make you see like a harpy eagle. Um, but some of the medicines are emetics and purgatives that make you throw up. And that is they make you throw up this, this, carrion odor that a bad hunter, because he, he, an animal escapes and dies, or because his wife's menstrual blood, or the brick meat burns, he gets this carrion odor in his body. And so the idea is to take these purgative, emetic, toxic plants to vomit up all that carrion odor so that when he goes into the forest, the game animal owner doesn't smell him and say, hide the animals from this guy, he's wasting on me. Um, there's also a lot of psychoactive plants that are used to, as hunting medicines. Now, I said 25% of the plants in the Machiginga Pharmacopoeia are hunting medicines. Another 25% are plants that women use to protect their children from the vengeful spirits of game animals. It's a technology, it's this complex technology that they use to prepare a man's body to hunt and to protect children from the revenge of these, of these, uh, of these spirits. So it's a, it's a kind of medicine, they call them medicines. And so why should we look down on them and call them charms or superstitious or whatever? Let's just call them what they are. They're, they're medicines. They're, they're, there's powerful technology that indigenous peoples use to, to maintain a harmony with the natural world, which is how they get their food. Now, turning into jaguars is something that happens actually relatively often in the Machiganga communities today. Cornelio was an old friend of mine. Um, Pinpaikum, he would, every time I would write, he'd give me the, the most delicious pineapples I've ever had. Like, had these huge, delicious pineapples. Um, he was just the sweetest, kindest old man. Um, but when he was young, someone gave him kawini to be a good hunter. And as he got old, everyone said, he's turning into a jaguar. There was a jaguar in the village near his house. And everyone said, that jaguar is Cornelius. And he said, I took Kawini when I was young. I didn't know, no one told me what it, you know, it made me a great hunter, but now I'm turning into a jaguar. And I'm afraid I'm going to kill my own wife. I'm going to kill my own, my own children. And it happens that this is actually fairly common. And the idea is that certain old people, people who have taken Kawini, but also other old people, they would just walk up into the forest and vanish. And they say they would go up into the sky, they would, you know, they would, they would vanish. They would, they would climb up into the Milky Way and become stars. Um, of course, once, once uh, you know, I don't want to be a burden on my, my family, they just walk off and, and, and vanish. And that avoids them going into decrepancy and old age and turning into jaguars. Now, with missionaries and Western medicine, um, elderly people live long lives and they get older and they get older and they get older and they get decrepit and incontinent. And, and you know, anyone who's cared for an old person who's in this situation knows that. There's, there's this period of, of senescence in life. We call it Alzheimer's. For the Machinga, we call it Alzheimer's. They call it turning into a jaguar. And now that there's lots of old people in the villages, and there's lots of jaguars in the villages, there's a one-on-one -one association. Every time a jaguar appears in a the village, they say normal jaguars are off in the forest hunting peccaries. 
the human jaguars are the ones that come to the village. They kill dogs, they kill chickens, they kill people sometimes. And at first, it, 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 why do they think like the, the jaguar is the most feared animal in the forest? Why do old people turn into jaguars? It didn't make any sense. But if you think about it, one time they showed me one of these were jaguars that they killed. This huge animal, gigantic head. They said the, 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 these human jaguars are much bigger than ordinary jaguars. And they killed one and they burn it because they don't want the person to come back. And they showed me its teeth and the teeth were all rotten now. And suddenly it hit me. They're old jaguars. Old jaguars can't hunt anymore and they come to the village to get easy prey. And so there's this unconscious association between old jaguars and old people, I think. And so why is it that, that you know, there's these two top predators in the forest, the harpy eagle and the jaguar. And the plants associated with the harpy eagle are considered to be good plants. The plants associated with the jaguar are considered to be bad plants. And sort of thinking about this, um, you know, the harpy eagle kills monkeys and takes them to feed their young. The jaguar plays at killing. The jaguar will kill seven, you know, like a cat. They'll sit there and play with the animal and they'll kill just for fun. So, you know, the jaguar that killed seven dogs, he didn't kill the seven dogs to eat them, he killed to sort of play around with them. And so I think that maybe, you know, even though the jaguar is ex respected and admired, it's, it's malicious form of predation and, and, and cruelty makes it considered to be a dangerous animal to be associated with. Whereas the harp eagle, which kills to feed its children, is considered to be a positive spirit uh, guide in terms of getting plant, you know, plant medicines. Another really important plant, both for hunting and for baby bathing and for a bunch of other things, is what they call pdp. -pd. You probably, if you've been into a market in Bukhara, you've heard of pdp. -pd. It's, um, it's, it's this little plant that looks like a like the grass. In English, we call it nutgrass or sedges. Um, and they have, they, you know, they grow, it's the same family as papyrus, you know, Egyptian papyrus, it's the same family. It's called the Cyperiaceae. And so the Machinga use, they have these cultivated varieties, they have dozens and dozens and dozens. You go to one garden, you'll find eight or ten varieties. The man has eight or ten varieties, the woman has eight or ten varieties, and they use them for all these different things. They use them to facilitate childbirth. They use them to, have, to, no, to, to not have babies or to have lots of babies. They use them for headaches, to cure insanity, or there's a variety of causes insanity. Um, they use it to treat, create, to, to, to treat bad dreams, depression, um, wounds, snake bite, um, to be a good singer, to be a good weaver, to spin cotton thread, medicinal plant of the Amazon. There's been very little work done on it, surprisingly. Um, it's used all over, the, you know, all over Brazil, all over the Amazon. The interesting thing about it is, if you look at this list, all these uses seem contradictory. And so for many years, ethnobotanists looked at this and said, oh, this is just superstition. How can the same plant, I mean, it's, it's all the same species. They're just different cultivated rice. How can the same plant be used for birth, for birth control, to have babies, not have babies, to cure insanity, to cause insanity, to be a good hunter, to be a singer, to snake bites. So what, what has happened is indigenous peoples, they've taken the naturally occurring ergot alkaloids in these sedges, and they've, through the process of selective breeding, they've upped the content of ergot to the point where the plant can no longer reproduce itself. It, can, it doesn't produce seeds anymore. And so the plants are loaded with ergot. And this is what Plowman and Keith Clay found when they looked at their pharmacology. And if you think, what does ergot do? Why was, why was Albert Hoffman looking at ergot? They were looking to develop the birth control pill, because ergot causes uterine contractions. In the Middle Ages, ergotism caused St. Anthony's fire, which is extreme vasoconstriction, which would cause gangrene. It caused abortions. It caused insanity, LSD. And so if you look at the Machinga uses, childbirth, fertility, they still use ergot to treat migraine headaches. You know, so ergot affects uterine contractions. It's a vasoconstrictor, which makes it good for headaches. Basal constriction makes it good for snake bite, for wounds. The psychoactive components can help understand why it's used to be a good hunter to be a singer. So, so this plant that ethnobotanists for a long time rejected as being superstition, because how could one species have all of these different contradictory uses? When you take into the fact, count the fact that, you know, my hypothesis, I'm, I have a student right now, a, a doctoral student, is looking at this out of, out of University of New Mexico, to look at the 
look at the pharmacology of different varieties. And my theory is that each one of these cultivated varieties has a different, I mean, the, when they did it, they found eight novel ergot alkaloids in a single specimen. So you could imagine that they, through, through selective breeding, they could be selecting for unique cocktails of ergot alkaloids in each one of these varieties that has different kinds of different kinds of uses from you know fertility to childbirth control to birthing to snake bite and so on. Las medicinas que tienen por qué hoy día sufren tanto? Primero las viro, las virosis, la gripe, este el sarampión, son enfermedades que ellos no tenían experiencia en el pasado. <coughs> y hasta los as, los los las verminosis, el el este los lombrices, este el mismo el mismo La bacteria que causa caries no es nativo de aquí. O sea, la, la invasión de los europeos ha traído virus, ha traído parásitos, ha traído bacterias que en su, en su inmunología, inmunología este, natural no existían. Y además de eso, hay un proceso de sedentarización, la escuela, la iglesia, la cosa de salud. Entonces la gente está viviendo, antes los machiquines vivían unas familias, vivían 7, 8 años, después hacia chakra lejos, iban para más lejos, y mantenían un ambiente más limpio, porque siempre estaban más limpio y, y siempre con recursos. Se agotaban los recursos acá, iban a otro sitio. Ahora, por la, 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 las intervenciones del Estado, de las iglesias, la gente está sedentarizando. Y en esos lugares sedentarizados hay una proliferación de, de bacterias, De, de parásitos, de anemia, yo creo que tenían plantas, estaban bien adaptados y cuando tú ves a la gente aislada, los, cuando salen del monte están saludables con todos sus dientes fuertes, o sea, tenían conocimientos de plantas chamánicos, eh, conocimientos ambientales para estar saludables en su condición original, pero ahora con la llegada de las enfermedades, las nuevas formas sociales, este, su Su, su conocimiento de plantas medicinales no es suficiente para, para combatir las enfermedades nuevas que vienen. The, this, you know, indigenous peoples, their manipulations of species, it's beyond just cultivating a plant. It's like there's this famous article about a virus that's in a fungus, it's in a plant. As science is, is delving deeper into the complexity of, of life, you know, we're full of multiple species. We've got all these, we've got all these E. coli in our guts, and you know, species are not single entities. They are they may, made up of these multitudes of beings, and and indigenous you know indigenous people take advantage of this multitude of layers of life, sort of these shamanic fractal layers of, of, of relationships, um, and take advantage of it. And so when you think about indigenous concepts, how they use plants, um, <clears throat> people used to call them primitive peoples or non-scientific peoples, but sometimes it seems that they're ahead of the science. Um, and even there's this new movement of plant intelligence. Like, they, they, there's research showing that plants can learn <clears throat> Pavlovian, like Pavlovian avoidance, sort of Pavlovian, um, what do they call it, Pavlovian, um, uh, you know, w when you learn to, when the dog learns to, 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 to salivate when the bells rung, plants do the same things. They learn, they, they can have Pavlovian, you can, you, can, you can train them to have Pavlovian responses. So, so and, and this, these relationships, these complex relationships between fungi and plants, there's this whole network of tr trans species communications that indigenous peoples understand and are aware of and use, as in the example of the ant plant example. And so these emergent scientific understandings of biosemiotics, plant communication, dialogues very well with these very well established shamanic concepts like plants as teachers. I met her in 1987 when I got the award. She was very, and I, I stayed in touch with her until she died. Um, and she said, you know, um, you know, I loved your project, you know, this idea of using traditional medicine and modern medicine to bring better health. But she said, you know, sometimes, uh, it's a great idea, but you know, sometimes a simpler thing as water can, can, can transform the health. You know, my husband went all over Africa building wells for indigenous people, and sometimes water can, can transform health in indigenous peoples. And you know, that idea sort of stayed in the back of my mind, and now, you know, all these years later, 
in the past you know, 15 years, I've been working with rainforest flow. And that's, that's why I'm here now. I'm working in Peru. Mariana here works with us in rainforest flow as well. And for the past 20 years or so, we've been using different technologies, slow sand filtration, um, to bring water and sanitation systems to the same villages where I've worked all these years, Wakaria, Taikomio, now have clean water systems that use you know, gravity-fed um, you know, gravity systems that don't need pumps, uses slow sand filtration, uses rock and, rock and gravel and sand to filter the water, and you get this pretty much complete decontamination of water to zero coliform bacteria just using sand. And so, so um, you know, old Marie Curie, Eve Curie lab, we told me this, you know, 30, almost 40 years ago. And now, sort of karma caught up to me, and now in this interest in working with indigenous health and indigenous ethnobotany, which I'm still interested in, we've been able to improve people's health through bringing water systems. And so I encourage you to, to look, look up rainforest flow, and there's some beautiful images and photos. Um, I'm done now. I just wanted to thank some of the funding organizations that have funded me over the years. These are some of the Machiginga elders who taught me so many things, and these are all people who have now passed on to the, to the great Milky Way River in the sky. Um, and a final note of thanks, Matteo Italiano was my, um, he spent two years in the field with me doing my dissertation. He was my main Machiginga guide, and he died today in Cusco. I visited him yesterday. He suffered a stroke related to COVID, most likely. And um, <clears throat> I visited him yesterday in the hospital, and his wife just called me, and he seems to have lost the battle. Uh, he was suffering for many, for, you know, he got, he got COVID in 2021. So he was a really key person in all this research that I was doing, helping me translate these concepts. He's come, he, he sort of, he had a foot in both worlds. He was, you know, he was a, he was a shaman, he was a plant person, a healer, but he also understood, you know, he'd grown up around white people, he'd worked in film, he, he worked on Fitzcarraldo, the film, he was, when he was a young man, he worked for, on Werner Herzog's film as an extra. So he sort of understood both worlds. He was a wonderful, um, wonderful cultural translator and sort of, kind of a, a, a trickster, brickler kind of figure who really helped me through the years and it was just really sad news that, you know, that we lost him today. So that's it. And that's when I saw him before his extraordinary.